really appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak here, though I have to say a, a one-hour talk right after lunch is a tough, tough time slot. So um, I'm not going to speak for a whole hour up here. Um, I'm going to cover three uh, topics, talk a little bit about BARDA, um, what we've been, been since our formation over the last 17 years. Some of you will know that. Um, some of you won't want to make sure that we're all on the same page. And I'm going to spend some time focusing on our areas of interest as we think about fiscal year 2023. What are we particularly focused on? And then spend the last portion of the discussion talking about some of our funding mechanisms that we have out there already and then some of the new ones that we might have coming out over the next few months. And just, just so that everybody's kind of on the same page, the very last slide that I'm going to pre present is a slide that shows about four websites. And frankly, everything that I'm going to say today, you can go to those four websites and pull down the same information. We're pretty transparent and open about what we're looking for, what we want to do, and where we want to go. Uh, that's something that comes from our director, Dr. Gary Disbro, and something that we maintain is very important as we go forward. So um, BARDA sits within the um, ASPR, Administration uh, for Strategic Preparedness and Response, um, within the Health and Human Services. I will try not to do too much alphabet soup today. Um, ASPR has three primary key response, uh, priorities when we think about where we're going over the next um, um, year, extending capabilities to respond to COVID-19, restoring resources and capabilities during the pandemic, and then importantly, preparing for the future of emergencies, whether natural or man-made. And it's really this third bullet that I'm mostly going to focus on today. Where are we going in the future? Where does BARDA fit into that mission space around um, in regards to medical countermeasures? So BARDA was formed in 2006 uh, in response to a challenge faced by, by many nations, which was we had a lot of products that were important from a public health perspective that were getting through preclinical and phase one, but because in many cases, not all, but in many cases, lack of a commercial market, weren't moving past phase one into phase two into licensure. And so we had a really significant gap, not just for health security threats, but also public health threats. So BARDA was formed to bridge that so-called valley of death. I'm sure many of you in this room are familiar with that. Many of you are struggling with that. And so that is BARDA's core mission. So when we think about the primary focus, it's really on that later stage of development, looking at phase two and beyond. But I am going to stop just for a minute and, and talk about that and put that into some context. So one of the things that BARDA does, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later as well, one of the things that we do is look to integrate new technologies into our existing products or our products that are in development. And so one of the things that we've been doing a lot over the last three or four years, interrupted a little bit with COVID, uh, but we're really moving back into, is, is looking at some of these earlier technologies some of these technologies maybe that are being developed for other indications, other fields that aren't kind of in our typical space, and saying, can we do a little bit of support to move those, to pivot them, to see if they help us in what we're doing? And that's why I think it's a great opportunity to, to talk with this audience. You have such a diverse array of technologies and things that you're, you're working on. You probably saw the BARDA thing coming up, and you're like, I don't work in that, in that particular space. I don't have something for pandemic influenza. I don't have something for chemical or rad nuke. But think about your product, think about what you're doing in this threat agnostic approach. And that's something we're really looking to do as, as we continue to move forward. So Bar BARDA has a model that we've, we've used now for or the 17 years that we've been exist in existence. Uh, we tweak it a little bit, but this, these five fundamental core, uh, these five items get at the core of our being, all right, and how we work how we move things forward. So the first is flexible and nimble authorities. We have some authorities that are, are unusual and unique um, relative to uh, the general, um, which you might see for some of the other agencies, including some of our OT authorities, as well as some of our funding authorities. We have multi-year funding. I'm going to touch on that in a minute. Within BARDA, we also have cutting edge expertise. Again, something I'll talk about more. Facilitate partnerships, and then finally, promote innovation. And again, this is touching on that area about taking technologies, maybe being developed for something else, and developing them into our threat space. So I mentioned multi-year funding. So most of you are, this is all public information. You can go down and look at our, our annual appropriations over going back however many years that you want. What you don't see, though, in looking at this, at this chart is the type of funding that's come in. Right, and so a, a lot of funding um, within the, the U.S. government cycle is what we call annual year, meaning you have to spend it the year you get it. A lot of our funding is multi-year money, and what does that do? That gives us a lot more flexibility. It gives us a lot of flexibility working with you, so we don't have to worry about an end of fiscal year when we're doing our negotiations and our discussions, when we're trying to hit milestones and deadlines. We have a lot more flexibility. We're able to fund a, fund a project. If that project, for, for whatever reason, doesn't move forward, we, that project ends early, we're able to uh, recover costs and then put them on other projects that are continuing to go forward. So that's a tremendous amount of flexibility for us, and therefore, uh, as we're working with our partners. 
The second thing um, that I wanted to touch on is around the, the, the people within Parta. So we partner with a lot of different um, um, developers, from those that are, are very, very small to, to some of the largest uh, pharmaceutical companies in, in the world. And each of those partners has some, some great things they bring to the table, and sometimes they have some gaps when we think about all, that's, you know, all the expertise that's needed to take stuff all the way to licensure. So we provide support um, as needed with, with our own expertise. So within BARDA, we have a lot of experts in our vaccines, our therapeutics, and our diagnostics areas, people that have taken multiple products through licensures and clearances that they sit on those project teams. And then we also have our cross-cutting expertise, our regulatory, as well as non-clinical and clinical support that we're able to provide, sometimes even for situations where we might not have a, a significant size contract, a development contract, but if, we, if there's a niche gap that needs to be filled, some of our non-clinical support and our clinical support can provide some of that help. BARDA relies entirely on partnerships. We do not, on our own, license or clear a single product. Okay? It is all about partnering with developers and taking those products to licensure together. And, and that is fundamental to our core. It's a partnership. Like with any partnerships, um, you know, sometimes we have some challenges, but at the, at the core of our being, it's, it's partnerships. And we partner with, with um, companies within the U.S., we partner with global companies, we partner with international partners, we partner with international governments, um, you name it, we partner with them, including within the U.S. government. So a lot of the work that we do, a lot of the products that we receive, receive funding earlier in their life cycle from our other government partners, whether it's, it's NIH or um, a, a group within Department of Defense or somewhere else. And we recognize the importance of all of that knowledge and, uh, from those early stage work making sure you don't lose that as you, as you go into advanced development. So we're very, very inclusive in making sure that we're talking across the government with all of the other funders and then keeping them engaged as we move forward with uh, product development. And so over the last 23 years now, we most recently hit our 66th um, approval uh, in partnership with our developers. Um, they're, they're listed here. And what I really want to talk about in the next couple of slides is when th people think about BARDA, they, they read about BARDA, a lot of our, our work is in the health security threats. And so, you know, many of the products we work on licensing are ones that, frankly, we all hope won't ever have to be used. Um, but, but we also partner with a lot of developers for products that are used in the commercial and the public health free, um, on a, on a daily, daily basis or in response to certain outbreaks. So I'm just going to cover a couple of them here. So <laughs> Ebola medical countermeasures, everybody's aware of the multiple Ebola Zaire outbreaks we've had over the last 15 years in partnership with uh, various developers. You know, over the last five years, we've seen a regulatory approval for a vaccine, a therapeutic, uh, two therapeutics, and a diagnostic. And you know, the impact of that is huge because you remember back to the outbreaks of, of the early 2010s and even before, there, were, there was no treatment, no licensed vaccine. It was all just management, public health management. Now when there's an outbreak, these products are readily available and rapidly move, move out. Similarly, within our burn group, within CBRN, we do a lot of work with uh, developing products for, for burn, uh, burn blast, and those products are very relevant to routine uh, clinical care right now, including uh, the Silver Lawn, which we just got a, a, in partnership with our partner, uh, just received an additional indication for. So um, next, to talk a little bit about pandemic influenza. So we have a, a fairly large, robust program in pandemic influenza. Um, in 2005, you look at where the, the field was in pandemic influenza, but also for seasonal influenza. And you'll notice that uh, really all the manufacturing was egg-based um, and only a couple of, of products on the market. Um, BARDA partnered with a lot of developers, and as a result of that, we've in certainly increased our pandemic influenza response capabilities, but we've also increased the seasonal um, vaccines that are out on the market in terms of, of breadth and type. And finally, the last one I'll talk briefly about is our antimicrobial, um, our AMR efforts. Um, this is something that's well known that the challenges of public health right now are about antimicrobial resistance. And so if you look over the last decade, BART has invested over $1.5 billion, uh, resulting in our, with our partners, again, with over three uh, regulatory approvals for products that are out on the market right now. So this covers a little bit in terms of what BARDA does around preparedness. Um, we also have a, a pretty significant role in, re in response. Um, when we look at what's happened over pre-COVID, um, you have the H1N1, the Ebola, and the Zika. 
In response, is BARTA has, has really two rules. If there's an available product out there, we provide support to make sure that it's being manufactured and being made available for distribution uh, through the, the appropriate channels. We really work with the, on the manufacturing aspect. In parallel, though, if there's no countermeasures available, we work to develop new products during those outbreaks uh, with our partners, of course. And you can imagine the challenges of that. <clears throat> But this was kind of the background then, of course, as we go into, into COVID. I'm just going to spend a couple minutes about that. I'm, I'm sure everybody's aware of these um, avenues around the COVID response. But I think it's important because it kind of lays out the framework as we move forward, both in terms of what, what um, lessons learned, but also some of the things that, that turned out to work as, as we had, had um, targeted. So this is a slide that we presented February 2020. Um, laying out kind of the strategy and what it would look like. And as you can see, a key component for us is leveraging existing contracts. So when we think about partnering, we think about partnering, you know, when we're putting those contracts in place, both in terms of, of outside of a response, but then also uh, when we have the middle of a response. And then uh, the second thing is around prioritizing development of MCMs based on public health impact and their probability of success. And then finally, establishing domestic-based U.S. manufacturing. So just in the interest of time, I'm not going to really talk a lot about these slides. These are, are, are just a little bit more detail about the, the COVID response overall and some of our efforts. Really just what I want to talk about is it was a, a, um, lot, of, a, a lot of effort across the board, right? This is a whole of government response, but also a whole of partnerships. And we leveraged the partnerships that we had in place to do almost all of the initial response work that was done. I think that's a really important point, is we're thinking about, again, developing those partnerships. We think about them in pre-outbreak, pre but we, we think about how are we going to pivot those to make them useful during the outbreak. And so this is a final kind of where did we end up, at, you know, where are we today in terms of the response and the capabilities and what was done. And again, we just want to call out the 146 partnerships. So that was, that was the, the number of times we reached out with, with groups just like yours, develop a partnership to, to move products forward. So that's the past. Um, so as with everything, right, what have you done for me lately? Um, so where are we going to go to the future? What do we see happening in, in, in 2023 and beyond? So the first thing I encourage everybody to do if you're interested in BARDA, interesting with partnering with BARDA, uh, we put out an updated uh, strategic plan in uh, May of 2022. We've all worked with strategic plans, right? And we all know that some strategic plans are, are put on paper and then they, they get put on a shelf and they collect dust. Um, this isn't one of those. Our, our director, Dr. Gary Disbro, was adamant when he assumed the role that he wanted a strategic plan that would really guide how BARDA will function going forward over the next five years. And so this is the, is the meat of where, what BARDA is going to be doing. So if you want to know uh, what it is, it's not what I say in this talk, it's what's in this plan. It's, it's got some good detail. I'm not going to talk about it all other than to say it's got the four main pillars, preparedness, response, workforce, and partnerships, making sure that we have in place not just the, the funding, right? It's not enough to have, have money, right? We have to have the mentality, we have to have the mechanisms that work for you as well as for us. So how do we continue to innovate in that space? All right, so what is our space? So this, uh, we call it our, our wheel. Um, this wheel, and I know it's small, but um, this really represents our, our key, our core areas of interest in terms of what bugs and what threats we are looking at. So pandemic influenza, burn blast, rad nuke, certain other um, infectious disease agents, as well as our uh, threat agnostic um, agents. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So we have, these, we have this threat wheel with all of our individual items listed that we're, we're really focused on. How do we attack them? How do we develop medical countermeasures against each one of these numerous threats? And importantly, how do we prepare for the unknown, right? Because that's really what, what, what gets us. You can do a lot to prepare for a known. It's, it's hard, it takes time, but you can really identify how to do it. How do we prepare more for that unknown? And how do we start thinking about sustainability? So one of the biggest challenges we have, as I mentioned before, 66 regulatory approvals, many of these products don't have a commercial market. And so right now, how do we sustain that? And as we go forward, this approach has been very successful for us, that sus those sustainment challenges become greater and greater, and what does that look like? And so one of the things, so we're gonna continue that. The, the, the threat-specific um, um, products, very important, all right? But we're also doing something we've done in the past, and are gonna, it's gonna become a bigger focus, is first around the threat agnostic MCMs, or host direct um, or targets that are directed against the host. There we go. 
so when we think about threat agnostic, when we think about, we think about targeting the host or we think about targeting the injury. And so I'm just gonna show a couple of slides about that, a little bit more what we, what we mean about that. So many different, th many different agents, not just those in our threat space, but outside of that threat space, have an impact on, on the host. Right? And a lot of times there's a lot of similarities of that impact across bugs. And so looking at the host, are there some products out there? Again, this is this idea about you might be developing a product for, for something out here that's not something you think about in, normally in BARDA space. But maybe we've got a bug that causes a similar symptom, causes a similar pathology, and maybe then we'd be able to get some, some work in that area. So for example, one of the things that we're looking at a lot is ARDS, a big concern for us for pandemic influenza, but obviously a lot of pathogens cause that. So what does that look like? And I think over the next year, we're gonna see a, a, a lot of movement in that space. The chemical group within CBRN has a big emphasis on this area as well, and not just from, and for, for them, they really talk about treating the injury, um, because as you can imagine from a threat space, the number of chemical agents out there, there's just no way you could, direct, you could develop a product for each one of those. So they have talked for years and been very successful with a threat agnostic pipeline of countermeasures looking at repurposing, as well as, any, as when we talk about end-to-end, -end, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more, thinking about that end user. Because it doesn't matter if you got a product with a great indication, it doesn't matter if you got a product you can get where you want it to be, if the end user doesn't know how to use it. Right, and so something that's very important, they've done some pioneering work in this area with our collaborators, and it's really important as we continue to go forward. All right. The second thing is around improving access and capabilities. So <clears throat> I'm a product developer, that's what I've, I've done my whole life, and so once that product goes into a vial and the FDA comes in and, and gives their stamp, I'm good, I'm, I'm, I'm done, it, it's gonna go, and, and somebody else then can start, start working through um, getting it out. And so I always understood the challenges around access, um, kind of how do you get it to that end user, make sure it's done equitably. But I never really appreciated the challenges and what that really means until as, as part of the COVID response, um, <clears throat> we were, after, after the development, um, one of the things that um, I, I was involved with a little bit was, was the distribution. And the distribution wasn't just the logistics of shipping that, that many of you probably think about. It really was how do we get product everywhere, right? Because again, when you think about the, the, with the COVID, right, we had, lot, we had many products ready. The real challenge was how do we get them everywhere? Then the challenge became not how do you get them everywhere, but how do you get them to the right place? And then the challenge was how do you get them in somebody's arm? How do you get somebody to take it? And that really made me understand how small details have a huge impact. You know, your method of, of, um, of, of injection, who can do it, how qualified, how trained do you have to be? The huge difference, right, from going from something that might be an IV administration to an IM, on your ability to get it into an arm. Okay, huge difference. So incredibly um, eye-opening for me. Um, we had some fantastic people on the team who worked through this, knew this. You know, they, of course, knew this incredibly well. And so as we think about going forward, you know, keep component of us has always been ensuring and improving access and capabilities. It's not that we didn't care about it, it's not that we didn't think about it, but I think we now, we learned a lot about how to do it and what's important. And one of the key aspects of this is that there's a lot of new technologies out, of there, out there that can really have an impact on this if we figure out how to bring them together and how to make it work. So when I think about access, I think about these five things, okay? I think about, I gotta get product made fast, okay? I've gotta get it to your house, okay? I have to make sure that you're willing to, that you're gonna easily be able to use it, and that as soon as you identify that you have something that you're able to get a treatment. I also have to figure out a, a better way to test products. So we think about our overall approaches to testing products during a pandemic. You know, how do we make it so I don't have to have the congregation? How do we make it so that people that maybe don't have the time but to go to, you know, to some off-site place to, to get their, their treatments and stuff, how do we enable enrollment of those people into trials? Because so we can have the right breadth of population, so we can really have a lot of confidence in those, in those products. So reimagining how we conduct some of those clinical trials and what that looks like. 
And then finally, thinking about sustainment. It does no good if we work hard, get a product license, and we can't sustain that production. Okay, so what does that look like? As I mentioned, I, I'm hugely hopeful because I think that there are some tremendous technologies out there that can address these challenges. Okay. But I also think we can't look at them in a vacuum. Right? So I look at this, this right here. These are some uh, various things that have been looked at and have been discussed, all very, very important. Okay? But individually, they don't get us where we need to. They don't get us to where we need to be. So I like to, sh I, I like to show this example of just one thing, that end-to-end -end solution. All right, so this is about, and, and what do we need to do to, to really envision this, all right? So this is a, a pathway that you could imagine around um, going from, at the end of the day, it's not about the diagnostics, it's not about the manufacturing, it's how do I get somebody treatment as soon as we can? So many of our infectious disease treatments, not just infectious disease, but other threats, right? It's all about time. The earlier you get that product to somebody and get it administered, the better your chance of saving a life, all right? <clears throat> so how do we make that happen as fast as possible? So this is, a, this is a, a, an approach, and it's an approach that's done, right? This, there's nothing new here. Many of these things are done, but they're done not necessarily as a full unit, and they're done in a silo, okay? So let's look at the first one. So manufacturing, right? So if you're going to put a, a product in everybody's house, right, I've got to, you have to have a cheap manufacturing, right? And a lot of discussion about what that looks like. and how much it costs, right? And the idea that we're going to get where we need to be by you know, lopping 10% off because we get some economies of scale, probably not gonna be enough to lower that price at the price point you need in terms of um, sustainment as well as in terms of sensitivity to make the mark. So I really think from a technology perspective, we're gonna see a revolution, I believe we're gonna see a revolution in how diagnostics are made. I have no idea what it looks like. I'm not gonna pretend that I do. If I did, I wouldn't be here, I'd be go doing that. But these are the types of things that we need to think about. How do we integrate and make this come together? All right, so I just wanna spend a couple of minutes then talking about where are we for pandemic preparedness for future threats. Uh, lots of people have published lots of documents about lessons learned from COVID-19. I'm not gonna uh, go over that. What I am gonna talk about is uh, briefly, this slide here, this is from BARDA's perspective, as we think about pandemic um, uh, preparedness and response going forward, this is, these are the things that we're going to focus on, again, looking at, at for COVID-19, some of the things that, that worked, and then some of the things that we uh, definitely want to, um, that we think can, can be better. So we got the preparedness aspect, really looking at having a suite of licensed and stockpiled in MCMs. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, looking at our response capabilities, um, having in place mechanisms that allow us to put new work under contract faster, to move it forward. As I mentioned before, thinking a lot about end user and access, and finally partnerships um, for funding and sustainment. All right. So what's our strategy framework as we think about this, uh, these responses? So again, we have our vaccines, therapeutics, other countermeasures, focusing primarily on our, our priority pathogens, but then looking from a platform perspective. All right. What does what does that look what does that what does that look like in the context of pandemic flu? Developing a platform that we can pivot to another agent if we need to. I'm not going to talk about all of them. I just want to talk about the platforms for the uh, uh, faster vaccines and the faster therapeutics because I think they do a good job of um, showing the contrast and the extremes between the two of what we need to do. So. Everybody's aware, I think, with COVID-19, um, EUA for the initial vaccine approximately 11 months after the outbreak started, which is fast. That's you know, an incredible achievement, not meaning to minimize that at, at all. Okay, but still, now we're close to where we need to be in terms of a response timeline. You look at H1N1 back in 2009, the response timeline to pushing out a approved product was about six months. Okay? And you look at the strain change that occurred in the fall, 62 days. But you look at our response to, in a situation where we have a medical countermeasure that's approved, and it's 24 hours. So when we think about it from the vaccine perspective, this is why for us it's so important to have approved products. Nothing is faster in terms of a, of a, of a distribution, ability to get a product out there than an approved product. So BARDA is always going to aim for product approvals. I can, I can tell you that now. That's going to be our primary goal as we go forward. 
We know from the 62 days that it took with the um, mRNA products for the um, fall strain change that we have a pretty good roadmap of how to push out a licensed vaccine in less than 100 days. And so really kind of looking at why, you know, comparing the 11 months for the initial approval to the 62 days for the uh, subsequent um, boost approval. What did that look like? And this, and again, just in the interest of time, not gonna go through it all, but you can go through and kind of uh, tease out what are the four or five key attributes that allowed you to do that. So as we go forward, that's, that serves in some ways as a roadmap to how we might be able to be more confident that we can have a product, a licensed pr a product, and be able to flip that product to address a new age or a new threat in a relatively short amount of time. So I want to compare that then to the therapeutics. So I think most people are aware, um, 24 months approximately for EUA for a new chemical entity, 11 months, as I mentioned, for vaccine, 10 months, though, for the first monoclonal antibody to receive approval, so faster, actually, even than the vaccine. Five months for a repurposed agent uh, that was in phase three, repurposing that, receiving EUA. As I mentioned, the 62 days for the um, a boost for the vaccine, and then 24 hours to push out a licensed product. Same thing for the therapeutic. What I want to call everybody's attention to quickly, though, is, is around the monoclonals. So monoclonals, fantastic, 10 months to the first um, monoclonal approval, not able to adapt fast enough to the strain changes. Okay. So what does that mean? And 24 months for a new chemical entity, of course, too long. We're really going to be taking a step back, I think, and thinking about this from a platform perspective. I think we have a big gap, and I don't know how to fill that gap. Um, but that, I think, is going to be a strong area of interest for us over the next two to three years. What does that look like? Because right now, from a technology perspective, I'm not convinced there's anything out there that's going to address these gaps. I hope I'm wrong. I hope one of you have it. It'll be fantastic, um, and we'll be able to solve this problem much quicker than I thought. But this is something that has to be solved. All right. So I'm going to wrap up talking about partnership approaches. Um, I know I'm just about at time, so I'll be quick, I promise. Um, so we use uh, three mechanisms. We have the traditional, what I call the traditional push mechanism. Um, these are our broad agency announcements, um, requests for proposals, and easy BAA. These are all uh, posted on SAM.gov. They all list areas of interest. Okay? So if you want to know what BARDA really wants to do, what we're looking to do right now, you, you go to the website and those areas of interest are pretty detailed. It describes what exactly we're looking for. We have a couple of alternative push mechanisms, uh, the BART Ventures GHIC as well as the J&J uh, Blue Knight Partnership. And we have a couple of pull mechanisms that we've done in the past, uh, challenges. As we look to the future, I think the challenges provide some unique opportunities um, for us to, to partner and to move into new spaces without having to kind of upfront Make, de make decisions, to be able to say, this is what we want, here's the potential funding if you're able to get there in a certain amount of time. So we're still working through some of that, but I think that as we um, look to the future, that's going to be a big portion of it. Interest of time, I'm not going to go through this in, a, um, in, in detail. This just talks a little bit about the BAA. Again, that's our primary mechanism for, for funding our advanced development. We have our easy BAA that gives us some flexibility. It's, much, it's smaller awards, but gives us some real flexibility, especially when we're looking at new technologies. We use that uh, mechanism. We have the BART Ventures as well as the accelerator networks. <coughs> I want to talk a little bit about the easy BAA process. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, um, we have the area of interest out, um, and you apply to that area of interest. Your initial um, application, if you will, is, is what we call market research. It's a slimmed down version. It gives an opportunity for um, that to be, it's reviewed, and it gives an opportunity for feedback and indication about whether or not there's interest or not. And then if there's interest, then you move forward to the more full pro uh, proposal process. The advantage of that is you're not wasting time up front doing something that's a full proposal for, for a project that just may not fit. So, you know, when you say not interested, it's not that it's a bad project. It's just for us right now, it's, it doesn't seem like it's going to be a good fit. So the idea being it really saves all of you time from doing this full proposal uh, if, if, um, unnecessarily. All right. Um, and finally, 
Uh, last two slides, I uh, want to talk the streamlining the partnership opportunities. So these are the things in 23 we're targeting, no promises that it will make it out the door. Um, but we have the establishing the National Bio -manuf uh, Biopharmaceutical Manufacturing Consortium, which we expect, uh, we've had a lot of discussions around, expect some movement on that. Um, the BAA, we're looking to update that. The Easy BAA was updated um, about four months ago with new areas of interest. Um, we're looking to launch our Rapid Response Consortium. There's been some RFIs out about that. Um, some legislative uh, proposals to give us some additional authorities. And as I mentioned, really looking some more at some of these poll efforts. Finally, just want to talk about TechWatch real, uh, for a minute. Um, many, of, many of you have, have great projects and, and you're, you're not sure you know, if they might fit with BARDA or not. If you go to our website, there's a place where you can apply for a TechWatch and what that does is you insert some information on the web. Um, you're contacting, there's a meeting with the people from BARDA, the appropriate program staff. A lot of time it's other agencies besides BARDA, NIH, DOD will join that call. It's a chance for you to kind of present your technology to a group of experts who have a lot of experience in these fields, have a discussion about that. And then again, it's kind of the same thing as there may be some, some alignment there potentially and it's worth going forward or maybe it's just not quite right in terms of timing. Or, or maybe not quite a good fit in terms of areas of interest. But that's a really uh, nice tool for everybody to uh, get on the same page about, about the interest, about the program, as well as the interest. And as I mentioned, you can ignore or f have fallen asleep for my entire talk. If you go to these five websites, you're going to learn the same thing you learned over the last half hour. I really, really appreciate your attention. Thank you so very much for the opportunity. I'm fine, yeah, however you like to do it. Okay, great, so I'll open it up for any questions. Thank you so much for the great insight into your strategic initiatives, including the rapid response in making uh, access, um, to, uh, you know, the at-homes. The thing that comes to mind is adherence. In this, in this age of infodemic, as, as one of your esteemed colleagues talked about this morning, you don't really know the efficacy of these pro programs per se till you can capture adherence and, and, and the outcome. So have you considered any digital health oriented platforms in this regard to be able to capture the cause and effect, if you will? All right, so if I understood the question correctly, it was around digital health, really kind of post, post put distribution, if you will. So CDC has a, does a lot in that area around looking at, post marketing is not the right word, I'm gonna say um, post-approval as it's distributed out, what is the real-world effectiveness? Is that kind of, yeah. So primarily that is, is with CDC, they have a lot of work in that area. We, we support them, and I know that's a, a big level of interest. For us right now, we have not done a lot in that area. Um, in one of your slides, you showed the distribution of funds in the pandemic response. I think it was 80 billion to vaccines and therapeutics, and maybe 800 million to diagnostics. How do you see those buckets changing now that we're hopefully post-pandemic? You know, great question. So the funding, so a couple of things. So one, the funding slide that, that I showed was what had come to BARDA. There was a, a large amount of diagnostic work that was done outside of, of BARDA. Uh, it was funded through other mechanisms, other approaches. So don't assume that 800 was all that was spent on, on diagnostics. It was a significant portion of, of, of funding. For us, in terms of the R&D space, we don't have a set you know, criteria around what the ratio is going to be. It's really about uh, where the opportunities are and where the needs are. I look at it as um, you have to have all three to have a response. Um, you know, diagnostics, big generalization, people can disagree, that's okay. Diagnostics tend not to have some of the costs um, to get to licensure. And so our experience to date has been that those costs are, are relatively uh, lower as a, in terms of a percent, but it's not because we're less interested or we don't think it's important. It's just how it, much it costs to license each one of those. So again, my view is you got to have all three, vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. Thank you for a fantastic talk. Uh, with regard to the COVID pandemic response, have you looked at the scorecard to see what we have done particularly well and what has been the most cost effective? If I understood the question correctly, it was around the COVID response and cost effectiveness, those types of things. So from BARDA's perspective, what we really focused on is our space, right, which is the advanced development area. And so there's, we have a, a um, a manuscript that's been published that talks about lessons learned. So it's not a financial analysis, um, I think, like you were referring to. It's more, you know, again, what, what did we think went well? What do we, and as we go forward, what might we do a bit differently? I can't speak to whether there's been an economic analysis done. It's a great question. I'm sure somebody has, is looking at that, but that's not something we're doing right now. Um, 
<clears throat> Thank you so much for, for, for your support. So uh, my question is on the, on the response that are uh, basically threat agnostic. Uh, you, you focus on the case of basically home storage of uh, different products. My question is, what about the, the critical care? Is this a, a, an area of focus and what do you, what is the balance? Are you, are you allocating 90% for, for home storage type of uh, response mechanisms? What is the percentage to critical care? There, there is not. There is not a predefined. And so what I showed was, you know, it's not like our whole portfolio and everything is turning towards that, right? That's kind of a, of a dr pie in the sky. It's going to take a long time to do that. But you're always get not everything's going to be done from the home. I got that. I should probably uh, mention that. We think critical care is incredibly important. So you've seen maybe the ARDS. We've got a lot of interest in that. And that's just one of many things in that. So, yeah. Hi, great talk. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, your uh, global consortium that you're about to launch? Is, does that include manufacturing XUS? We're still working through exactly what that will look like. Um, you know, we've had some RFIs um, put out, kind of getting feedback, and so we're, we, haven't, we haven't made any final decision yet about, about some of those details. And so we'll have to make that before the solicitation comes out. This was a great talk, greatly appreciated. We heard mostly about bugs and uh, people that don't do bugs still see emergencies. Uh, when we had a pandemic, we didn't have enough ventilators. Uh, if you live in Puerto Rico, you need dialysis and there's a hurricane, some, you need to fly to, the, uh, to Florida or New Orleans to get it. If you have um, earthquakes, and we have mass casualties. How do you guys address those? So, great, great question. So there's a couple of things, and, and really important, all right? So I'm not, not minimizing at all, but, you know, but part of it is kind of what our, our mission is, if you will. And so we have the, um, that, that threat space that we focus on, um, which is the, the chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear. And so to you, the extent that some of the outcomes that you mentioned fall in that category, that's something that is of great interest to us and something that we pursue. If it's outside of that space, again, it's incredibly important, just doesn't fit within our mission space. Thank you. Uh, question being, uh, you spoke about medical countermeasures uh, in terms of vaccines and uh, monoclonal uh, as well as diagnostics, uh, but does BARDA also support, uh, um, or are there programs to support platform technologies that might help solve the questions you're asking, which is the variants keep changing and when you track, assess and track, and again, it's a countermeasure again kind of thing. Yeah. So I focused on, so, you, so you're absolutely right, you know, the focus is vaccines, therapeutics, um, diagnostics. That's primarily our focus, but we do a lot of other work that has an indirect impact on it. And it's, it's usually case by case, but it's always spelled out in those areas of interest. A lot of that is done under our, our easy BAA uh, program. It tends to be, um, not, it's not exploratory, but it's, a lot of times it's not clear how it might fit. And so there's a collaboration there with that to see what it looks like and then decide to move it forward. Does that answer your question? I want to.